Thank you guys small there. Okay, boys and girls of all ages. So what we are need to discuss today or what I wanna remind you about today is a couple of things, okay? Um, first thing is that any of you that have not um, scheduled a uh, information literacy uh, session with the librarian, with the college librarian. I think she's finished offering those, but she has lots of other things to do. So if you have not scheduled one of those information literacy sessions, and I do think that um, she doesn't have any left, like she, I don't think she's running any this week, I'm not positive. What you can do is um, on Canvas, uh, in our module, and I'll put it in the module we're in, I'll put it in the mitosis, uh, meiosis module. I will uh, put, I have um, my own, uh, let's see, I'll call it a Dr. Stewart um, library video. And it's mostly about how to use science correct. All right, so it will help you be able to find the articles that you need and give you a little bit of information about the assignment. As we discussed last week, I am going to push back the due date on the assignment and it's going to be a soft due date. It'll be next Monday so you can get it finished before spring break. If you're going to be away spring break, um, that what I mean by, by a soft deadline is I'm going to uh, put the assignment as a due date of next Monday, week from today. But the assignment will remain open until probably the Monday after that. So you'll still be allowed to submit after that. It'll get flagged as late. And I will take a couple of points off. I think it's five, but it won't be per day. It'll just be five points total on the handout. And in the assignment, it says five per day. That's, um, it's I mean by a soft deadline. So I'll put a deadline of next Monday. Uh, anytime you turn it in after a week from today until the following Monday, it'll just be five points off. And assignments were 50 points. It's a lab assignment. So it'll be counting toward your lab grade. Okay. So that's one thing that I need to tell you. And then the second really thing that I wanted to tell you. Sorry, very noisy children today. I just want to make sure I get it in by Monday and I'll get full credit. Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. Sorry. So I'm going to put... Um, a soft due date of Monday, I think it's March 12th, right? It's next Monday, the 12th. Oh, sorry, the 15th. So I'm gonna put a soft due date of the 15th, but the assignment, too bad I can't spell today, will remain open slash available, which means you can turn it in late until Monday, March, so I'll be like, um, with uh, minus five for those due dates. Uh, the assignment will close on Monday, March 22nd. Meaning um, at 11.59, which means you cannot submit it after that time, okay? So soft due date of this coming Monday, the 15th. Certainly you can turn it in any time before that. Um, hard due date with, if you turn it in after the 15th until next Monday, it's five points off. The assignment will officially close Monday, March 22nd at 11.59. And then after that, you'll be no, no longer be able to turn it in. So, and as I mentioned, it is a lab grade and it is uh, 50 points, worth 50 points. I have to grade it by hand. So um, it will not be graded the next day after you turn it in. It will take me a week or two. I'll probably spend most of spring break grading them. So um, just so you know that ahead of time, people keep, then now people keep asking me, you didn't grade, right? I'm not gonna grade it until I grade it. And then it'll show up in your column, right? 
All right, so that's kind of housekeeping things. Um, Wednesday, this Wednesday, March, what's today, eight, nine, 10? The 10th, um, we will uh, start practicing genetics problems. So try to get ready for that. Um, there are many videos to watch, and um, there's even a, one that's how to take a word problem and turn it into a Punnett square. So um, those chapters are divided up a lot. So again, after um, tomorrow, right, after you take the quiz tomorrow, you probably want to start to move on with looking at genetics problems. For the quiz, um, I don't even know what one we're up to for. Um, the one for these chapters, <laughs> just that's safe. Chapters uh, 12 and 13, mitosis and meiosis. That's why I wanted to spend a little time talking about today. I would, of course, number one, encourage you. Uh, to watch my videos. This is important because a lot of people are watching um, the Amoeba Sisters and various other formats of mitosis and meiosis. That's great. If you need help with understanding, that's not a great way to study for the test because I'm going to use the words that I use from the book and in the lecture videos. So I would encourage you very much to watch and take notes from the videos for chapters 12 and 13. There are also great, in mastering, there are some great uh, figure walkthroughs. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at those. I would encourage you to redo those or to, I don't know what they call it, in mastering, recharge the assignment or practice the assignment after you turn it in. Chapter, then I have some specific things that um, sort of like overview things that I would like to tell you from chapters 12 and 13 to focus on, but by no means is this all you need to know for the test, right? By no stretch of the imagination. But chapter 12 is divided up into the cell cycle, pretty much why cells need to divide. Well, first of all, that's, um, right? So why do cells need to divide? Remember, there are, there are three reasons for this, and I'm not going to go through them right now. You have to watch the video or read your book. So they're called roles of cell division. I would remind you a thousand times this only happens in eukaryotic cells, not bacteria. This only happens in eukaryotic cells, not bacteria, mitosis. Then um, it goes into a long discussion of the cell cycle. It is very important that you know the phases of the cell cycle. You know the approximate amount of time a cell spends in all of those phases, meaning if you look at the picture, the diagram 12.6, you can see that G1, S, and G2 make up most of the cell's life. It spends a very short time in mitosis. You do need to know all the phases of mitosis. We talked about this before. And including pre-metaphase, pro-metaphase rather, and there are, is a two-page spread in your textbook on page 238 and 239. And again, I think I reminded you to follow the most important things for you to pay attention to are what's happening to the nucleus, what's happening to the chromosomes. And what's happening with the spindle fiber. Right. And if you focus each of the phases on those three items, eventually by metaphase, they all become the same because they're all attached. The nucleus is gone. The chromosomes are attached to the spindle fibers. I think probably what is the most difficult for this uh, section, I think if I click that, I get a new one. The most, one of the most difficult things is the vocabulary. Right. So we talk about a chromosome. Right, and um, all eukaryotes have linear chromosomes. The number of different chromosomes that an organism has 
is denoted as n. So n equals the number of different chromosomes that an organism, like a species, I should say, mm, that's tough because there are going to be some exceptions to this, right? We call organisms that are diploid, which are pretty much all eukaryotes, we call them 2n, or they have two times the number of chromosomes. Haploid is just having one copy of each of the chromosomes. So 2n, if you're diploid, that means you have two copies of each from of each different chromosome. And the exception for that, of course, is going to be the sex chromosomes. So let's talk some examples real quickly, right? So let's say we are us, we're humans, right? So humans are n in humans is 23, right? We have 23 different chromosomes. We actually have 22 chromosomes. This is often amended. It goes like this. You'll see, that you'll see this, 22 plus sex chromosome, like that, All right? So for humans, 2n is what is equal to 46 total chromosomes, right? And we say they are in 22 pairs with one pair of sex chromosomes. That's a lot of chromosomes. Um, for, what, I, what I mean by that is, it's not a lot of chromosomes if you're comparing us to like a plant, like a fern or something, but it's a lot of chromosomes when you're trying to draw quick pictures in textbooks or on chalkboards or whiteboards to describe what's happening in mitosis and meiosis. So we don't use human cells. The pictures that you see in your book are not human cells, right? We use animal cells that are have a lot fewer chromosomes and it, they actually describe in your book that it's uh, lung cells from a newt that are in your textbook for mitosis on pages uh, 238 to 239. And the newt, I can't spell that very well. The newt, it says, um, this species has 22 chromosomes. For simplicity, the drawings only show six chromosomes. And what I wrote down was 2n equals six, n equals three. So in the drawings, n equals three or two n equals six, okay? So each, we're looking to some mitosis right now, right? And so we have special words for when a chromosome is just by itself, we refer to it as a chromosome, once it is duplicated, which happens in the S phase before mitosis begins, so that happens in S phase of interphase, once those chrom chromosome is duplicated, that's when we refer to the chromosomes as sister chromatids. Each chromosome is duplicated. So if we were talking about a human, for example, and we were talking about mitosis, right? I'll try to draw here because it might be a little bit better. Get rid of that. No, it's just this one. So really, if we have, if this is a human cell and we have the nucleus here, right? And there's the nucleolus. And inside of this are all 23 chromosomes. But this is a non-sex cell. So let's say this is a skin cell. So it's going to be 2N. 
right? So in that skin cell, then I'm going to have 46 individual chromosomes in there. You're not going to be able to see them, right? And when we draw them outside, you know, like we draw them cartoon-ish, right? I'm going to draw, the chromosomes are arranged by size, which is why when they talk about a karyotype, which is, either, I think it's the beginning of the next chapter. So the chromosomes are arranged by size. So let's say this is chromosome one. You, as a eukaryote, as a diploid organism, you have two copies of chromosome one. You have two copies of chromosome two. And let's just say for um, the sake of our little newt drawing here and our onion, right? You also have two copies of chromosome three. Right? And this is when the cell is I would say in interphase, interphase. So G1, S, G2. If the cell is being directed to move from G1 into S, every one of these chromosomes is going to be duplicated. Every one of these chromosomes is going to be duplicated. So instead of having n equals three to n equals six, right? After s, post s, that's when the DNA is duplicated. Post s, that's when the picture looks like this. That's when now I have the chromosomes that look like um, little four pieces put together like this attached at their centromere. These are, this is, this is this chromosome one and it's copy. This is this chromosome one and it's copy. Now I have four sister chromatids of chromosome one. I have to duplicate the chromosomes or I can't make a new cell that ends up with the same number of chromosomes. So all of these are going to be duplicated. And now we refer to them all as sister chromatids. So here's chromosome threes. I'm trying to make them look different, not only in color, but in size, because that's, like I said, that's how the chromosomes are ordered. They're ordered by size. Then we're gonna enter M for mitosis, right? Then we're gonna enter for the chromosomes condensing, the centromeres, the hepatocores, atta proteins attaching to the centromeres, the cohesins attaching in between the sister chromatids, the spindle fibers attaching to the kinetochore, all that metaphase, and then anaphase, the chromatids are going to be separated, telophase, they're going to be put back into um, two separate cells, and after we've doubled everything, when we divide it again, then we'll end up with two cells that are 2N. Each of these cells is going to have six chromosomes inside of it. Two black ones, two red ones, two green ones, just like the original cell had. Remember, they show you both an animal cell and a plant cell. They talk about um, the dividing of the cytoplasm. That's important. You need to know the difference between the cell plate and the cleavage furrow. We are not going to talk about 12.3 uh, per se and cancer cells and how they break down the phases of mitosis and all of the uh, cell clocks. Go to molecular biology, go to genetics, learn more about it, right? You can think of it as, um, it's interesting, but you can, and you can think of it as these are kind of like um, toll gates and they have to be accumulated. We have to accumulate a bunch of proteins to push the um, tuck point down so that the cell can proceed into the next phase. That's it for chapter 12, right? Because we're, like I said, because we're not gonna be talking about the cyclins. For chapter 13, it is a lot more complicated because we are essentially gonna go through mitosis twice, we call it meiosis, because we're going to produce sex cells 
and sex cells or gametes they are always in because these two sex cells are going to get together to form a zygote and the zygote is always going to be 2N. And the zygote is what's going to then undergo lots of mitosis to become some sort of adult form, right? Or some sort of adult or um, multicellular, let's say, form. Because in plants, sometimes that multicellular form looks an awful, they look almost the same or in some protists, they actually do look the same and in some fungus, they look the same. So it's not always to become um, a individual male or female individual. Right? Meiosis essentially with a few differences, right, is almost, is very similar to uh, mitosis twice, right? The main differences happen in prophase one, and then also um, anaphase one and anaphase two are very different. So you need to focus on the differences that happen there with the pulling apart of homologous pairs of chromosomes, because in meiosis, homologous pairs join together and there can be crossing over in prophase one. And then those homologous pairs separate in anaphase one, but the sister chromatids don't separate till anaphase two. And we end up with four cells. Each of them is haploid or N. Now in humans and most mammals, we don't actually end up with four cells. Um, sperm cells, which is when, if you watch the videos, you'll see me go through the whole thing with the sperm cell because sperm cells, you actually get four cells. Egg cells to produce an egg in a human female or in a, many uh, mammals you're only gonna produce a single egg and the other three cells, we call them polar bodies, and they are never going to mature into a whole cell. They get less of the cytoplasm each time there's a cell division and then their nuclear material just essentially degrades. This meiosis is so important because it is one of the uh, major sources of genetic variation among the offspring of the same two parents, right? So this is really important for evolution. This is really important for tracing a particular trait through multiple generations. And the reason is because of the crossing over in prophase one and um, what we would call independent assortment of the sister chromatids and then the fusing of two gametes from different uh, sort of genetic stock, if you want to think of it, to become that zygote, All right? So this is a huge, this is going to come back to us, not only in the next couple of chapters when we talk about Mendel, but it's going to come back again when we talk about evolution. All right, so I'm going to stop. I'm gonna stop sharing that and um, ask if you guys have questions. Um, I think I lost all my screens, so that's fine. If you um, have a particular question, I'll just go back. But I did want to ask if anybody had particular questions about mitosis or meiosis. Now, again, I repeat a thousand times, this isn't enough. You have to go back, watch the full hour long videos, draw the pictures, memorize the steps, memorize what happens in each of the phases, because the things that I just highlighted briefly there are the things of the major trouble spots, right? 
Um, this will be 45 seconds, a question, because there's not really anything that you have to solve in these um, questions. That's pretty, pretty standard. Um, I usually keep it at 45 seconds a question. The genetics questions, which you're going to get in the next um, quiz, chapters 14 and 15. And again, when we get to um, DNA replication, those probably go up to 50 seconds a question, because in some cases, you actually have to have a table that you can refer to to um, look, up the, look up what the DNA is going to be converted to in the RNA, which is going to be converted to in the protein. But these, this is sort of straight memorization, so 45 seconds. All right, questions about the content? Okay, well, library assignment. Um, okay, uh, to cure, go, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just gonna unmute myself. Um, so I, I just had a question about like the library assignment as far as like um, going into, uh, I, like I ended up missing the, the meeting, I guess, the Zoom meeting for, for the lady. So I just wanted to know, is there any other dates that um, I could do like sometime this week or today so that I can uh, get that assignment done? So this is what I have in Canvas. Um, and I think I just, I think I just mentioned this before you uh, joined the meeting. So let me just get to. Yeah, I'm sorry. I ended up. It's okay. It's okay. Room. Let me just get to where I can. Um, it seems like Canvas is running kind of slow this morning. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm having trouble getting into the portal. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know what that's about. All right, so in our um, class here, probably, let's see where I put it. There's a library video that I made myself, there it is, video of the library assignment. So I did already put it in here. So are we sharing? Can you see, you can't see this yet, sorry. Let me go back to where you guys are. All right, there, now I can share that with you. All right, so you can see this now, yeah? Yes. So, so right here, Takira, in um, mitosis and meiosis in module six, if you click on this uh, video for the library assignment information for information literacy, this is the video that I made to show you how to use Science Direct. So you can just watch this. It's a shortened version of what the librarian did. You do need to have a library card. Okay. So you have to have a library card because you have to put in your library card number in order to access Science Direct. And I'm not accepting this assignment with articles from anything else. So you can't use EBSCOhost. You can't use, you know, Google Doc. You can't use any of that stuff. You have to use Science Direct. And there's a reason for that. The reason is because all of the articles in Science Direct are peer reviewed. So it's to prevent you from getting a poor grade on the assignment by not choosing the right kind of article, right? So all of the articles inside Science Direct are peer reviewed. So you're already ahead if you use Science Direct to complete this assignment because you need to get one research article and one review article, but the review article also has to be peer reviewed. And when you watch this video, what you'll see is you can select, I actually wear this where I actually paused it, you can select what kind of article you want it to show you about your topic. So you can actually just click a button that says review article or research article or leave them both checked and you can find all of your articles at the same time, basically. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, so watch so, that video and then um, ask me if you have other questions. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll watch the video. Well, I mean, I guess I do have another question because I was looking over like what the assignment required. It said to just pick like an article. So I guess we can pick any article, but it has to be within the science direct lens, right? So it has to, no, you can, it, I believe the assignment said any topic. 
in biology. Okay. Right. And I want the research article and the review article to be on the generally the same topic. So for example, you might want to look up, I don't know, something about your favorite animal, right? You want to look something about whales or turtles. And you may find a really detailed research article because that's going to tell you what a scientist is doing experimentally on one little part of turtle life, right? Maybe on the how many eggs are hatching, maybe on um, how they're being able to find their nesting sites, maybe on predators of turtles, maybe on the number of turtles that get crushed crossing the road, whatever that is. The research article is going to be very detailed. It's going to be very hard to read because it's a, it's the audience is a scientist talking to another scientist. It's not you. You aren't the audience at all. Right? This is to practice because when you become a professional in your field, even if it's nursing, there are going to be articles of doctors talking to nurses and they're not going to talk to nurses in print the same way that they would speak to them in person. So it's to teach you some of the scientific language that people use when scientists are talking to other scientists. The review article is not going to be about the exact, exact same thing because a review article is a scientist saying, this is where the field is right now. This is what we, all the things we know, maybe just about turtle reproduction, maybe only about ocean turtles or, you know, um, maybe only about freshwater turtles. And so the review article is going to have a much broader focus and maybe your little piece that you studied in terms of your research paper, might it, it's gonna fit into that umbrella somewhere, but it's not gonna be the exact same thing. It, it can't be because the nature of, of a review is someone looking at maybe 300 articles and summarizing where we are in the field right now. And so anything that comes up maybe about turtle reproduction in freshwater may not may be barely be mentioned. Maybe it's just gonna be a section of the review article about turtle reproduction, right? So that's perfectly okay, but it has to be kind of on the same topic. And what I tell you guys in the video is I would avoid two things. I would avoid picking diseases because the research on the diseases is going to be very, very difficult. The research articles are going to be very difficult to understand. And I would avoid mental health because it's all self-reported data. So it's very difficult to um, corroborate, and it is often data on mental health often becomes data that's collected and submitted to these huge computer algorithms and statistical analysis in order to come up with maybe a correlation. With self-reported data, it's very difficult to get correlations that then can be hypothesis tested. So I would avoid that because it's going to make it more difficult. Although you're like, oh, but that's what I'm really interested in. Great. But that's going to make it way more difficult for you to tell me a specific experiment that was done with the, what controls were used on a particular group of people and the results of that experiment, right? So to help you be able to do this assignment relatively quickly and relatively painlessly, I would avoid um, I would avoid medical stuff uh, on purpose. I, I mean, usually I would tell students that. And the, and the reason is I would avoid things like diabetes, right? For example, a lot of people are like, oh, I want to do diabetes. I want to do heart disease. Okay, heart disease is too big. And so is diabetes. You could get a review article about that, but it, we would have to choose type one, type two, juvenile, um, gestational diabetes, right? There's all kinds of choices there, even for your review article. And then when you actually read a research article about diabetes, it's going to be about a study, most likely, that's being done in rats or mice. And it's probably a genetic study or it's a really highly chemical study. It's not going to be we took 50 people and tried them on this drug, right? So again, that's why unless you already know a lot about a particular topic, because this isn't a research paper. You're not going to tell me anything about the background. Don't care. Don't care at all. I care that you find a research paper and a review paper. You summarize the review paper. You summarize the research paper and include 
as much as you can your understanding of one of the experiments done in the research paper. So if you pick something that's super technical, it's going to be very difficult to make that description in your own words, right? Um, the other thing I would avoid is articles where there's a lot of uh, a lot of computer modeling. So, for example, students often run into this. Not always, but students sometimes run into this when they um, try to do articles about climate change, for example. Or um, that's the one that comes to mind off the top of my head. Or population projection studies, like other of an endangered species, for example. A lot of the there's some data that'll be collected and then it'll be put into a computer program running a certain algorithm to make predictions based on, you know, if the temperature increases one degree Celsius, if the temperature increases, you know, half a degree of Celsius. And as that's the experiment they're doing. So you're going to have to explain to me the parameters that they chose for their computer algorithm. So unless you're a computer science student, that's also going to be kind of difficult. So I usually tell people, and I think um, Lori Lennox, the librarian, has done a good job of saying, you know, just pick, pick like an animal or pick a plant or pick something very basic in biology that you're interested in, mildly, because this isn't a research paper. You're not looking up 50 papers. You're looking at two. Two. That's it. Right? So, it's, yes, it's difficult, but the most difficult part is reading the research paper and figuring out how to write a summary of it, like an annotated bibliography, a little bit longer than an annotated bibliography of a research paper. That's, that's the hardest part, and that's the part I want you to focus on. I don't want you to tell me all about, you know, this particular species of turtle. Don't care. That's not part of the report. It gets zero points, right? You can see very clearly And I'm not directing this just at you, obviously, Takira, because I, what I'm thinking about is all the students that are going to watch this video later today and be like, oh, yeah, I didn't understand what we were supposed to do for that. So I just didn't do anything yet. Right. But when you actually um, look at the library assignment, which looks like I already set that date as the 15th, these are the things I'm actually going to grade you on. Right? These are the things you actually get points for. There is nothing listed here for you to describe any general background information about your topic. Don't care. This is what you're going to get graded on. Did you get the right kind of paper, research article? Did you get the right kind of review article from a peer reviewed journal? Did you include the first page as a PDF of each of the articles? Did you do the bibliography correctly? Did you describe one experiment from the research article? in your own words, right? Grammar, plagiarism, and late, that's it. So yes, it's difficult, but don't make it more difficult than it already is. So right? would you saying, um, I just have a quick question. So would you saying like, don't, um, you know, move towards medical, like, cause I was thinking for my paper, I would do something as far as like sexual reproduction. That's something that I'm like very, very like interested in, but, at the same time, should I not? Because that's a part of like the medical field. Like if, if we go dive deeper into like, you know, why women have miscarriages or like um, like ovarian cancer or something like you're just saying like, you would steer clear of that? Well, it's, it's up to you. But the reason that I, the reason that I say that is because a lot of students, when they get there, they find out that the art of the scientific article is really difficult to understand. Right. So I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying don't, you know, you're forbidden, forbidden from doing that at all, but it sort of varies from person to person. And all of those things that you just mentioned casually, right? So if you started looking at ovarian cancer, if you started looking at, um, so miscarriage is too big of a topic, right? So that's going to be pretty much 30% of all pregnancies, especially first pregnancies, actually end in a miscarriage, mostly before people even know. So you do have to pick a specific um, reason or a specific like area of reproductive health that you think might be contributing to the miscarriages, right? So I get that. So you could pick a certain thing if you knew already, you know, like I have um, hemochromatosis disease. So I know that 
you know, I have an excess of bleeding and not producing enough hemoglobin, and that's a potential that would cause miscarriages, right? You could go down that road, but again, when you get there to the end to get the research paper, just be prepared, I guess is a better way to say it, to be prepared that when you get there, they're going to start talking about um, theory, microscopic molecular interactions between, and a lot of chemistry interactions between cells and hormones or cells and drugs and drugs and hormones. And if you don't understand all the chemistry, it's going to be hard for you to explain um, the research paper. That's all. Um, sometimes students get to those research papers and they're overwhelmed because it's all different type. Each experiment is going to be a completely different technique that most of you don't have the, the scientific background for yet. Right? Okay. That's all. So, I mean, if you can find one that you think is fairly easy to understand, most of the time the research articles are, you can't even read the title. Like, you'll have a hard time figuring out what it's even about. So, that's why I would say pick something that's not as not quite as technical because you guys don't know that much about biology yet right? okay that makes sense by the end of the semester you could do something very different than you can do now thank you you're welcome and i'm i'm happy to look at them some people have already sent me copies of their first pages for me to take a look at to see if it looked like a good article to use or a good set of articles to use um, for their uh, assignment. So you can certainly do that as well. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I will. Go ahead. I'm sorry I don't know the answer to this already, but the bibliography, is that the same as a work cited page? Yes. Okay, thank you. It does have to include all of the items that are listed there in the assignment so that I could actually find the article. Students in this project want to just put the link in. They want to just copy the link from Science Direct. And about 98% of the time, that doesn't work because the link is not live. Right? Unless we're doing it in a Google Doc or something where we're all in the same format. And so that's not helpful because I can't click on it and see your article. And I can't follow that path to get to your article for 50 people. Right? So I, I do want the actual citation. I want the authors, the year, the volume of the journal, what journal it is, because electronically what I find is students often think, they're like, oh yeah, I get it. Um, no faith, I'd rather have uh, APA because that's really more what um, science uses. Thank you. Yep. All right. Other immediate questions, either about the information literacy or, whoops, or chapters 12 and 13. Yes, I'm no. confused on binary fission. Okay. I can't separate it for some reason from everything else. <laughs> All right. Give me a second here. I was looking to see when, um, when is this quiz? Is it tomorrow? Wednesday. Oh, I put it on Wednesday. Oh, okay. So you have a couple days. All right. Okay. Sorry about that, Stephanie. I was just kind of um, drifting there. Okay, binary fission. Oh, look, that was still there. That's cool. So text first for binary fission. Only prokaryotes. That means only in bacteria. Ever. That means domain archaea. A E A, right? No. A A E. No. A E A. I really should have taken Latin. And domain. Uh, bacteria, we call it now. 
So those two whole two domains only, 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 only uh, binary fission. And the reason is because bacteria, prokaryotes, they do not have, right? They lack membrane bound organelles, including no nucleus because that would be a membrane bound organelle. And they only have a single circular chromosome. So they don't have, they do not have four chromosomes, two to n equal four, two n equal eight, and they have to duplicate all eight of those chromosomes. They have one chromosome to make a copy of. And as we're going to see, I'm looking a little bit in your um, textbook for where they put the binary fission while we're talking here. They just give it a little uh, mention sort of at the, um, the evolution of mitosis, right? So here's my bacteria. A rod shaped bacteria, bacillus. Here's my chromosome inside that bacteria. Right. And it's double stranded. It's still made of DNA. It has the four bases, is all of your chromosomes, but it's a single chromosome, single circular chromosome, just like that. So, and there is no nucleus here. So there are ribosomes. I'll try to draw some of those. There are ribosomes, bacteria are full of ribosomes. And, you know, of course, some bacteria have flagella. Make a little curly cue. Um, and they have all their structures inside of them, but they have no, they lack membrane bound organelles. So there's no endoplasmic reticulum, there's no chloroplast, there's no mitochondria, there's no Golgi, there's no peroxisomes, lysosomes, none of that, nothing. Just so bacteria can actually, here's the mind blow, they can multiply every 20 minutes because they don't have to duplicate all that extra stuff. They don't need hours and hours and hours to grow that much bigger and copy everything. They basically have to copy the DNA and divide themselves in half. So when a bacteria begins to get ready for cell division, for binary fission, I'm gonna to try to draw the bacteria larger this time. Basically all it has to do, as I said, is uh, grow a little bit in size and then make a copy of its DNA. So, I'm going to draw it like this and the new DNA I'll make green, All right? So it actually does the same thing that your DNA does in that it makes um, a new complementary copy. So I'm going to make the complementary copy green. And this is the, the original blue DNA here. So it makes this complementary copy and then essentially it just splits into in half. The cell just divides. I'm out of um, space here. I'm going to erase my, oh, there, solve that problem. And then it's going to split into two cells. It's going to divide up its cytoplasm. And now each of the chromosomes is going to be half blue and half green because it's um, DNA replicates semi-conservatively, which means each of the new copies ends up with one copy of old DNA and one copy of the new strand like that. So, the re so from here to here. So, and the reason this can happen so quickly, and we're going to talk about this when we get to like 16, is that when DNA replicates, oh, I'll use a different color. When DNA replicates, it actually has a spot where it starts. And in bacteria, that replication is bi-directional. So it's going to go both directions at the same time, which is going to allow for essentially all of the enzymes to copy the DNA. They only have to go halfway around. And they're going to run into each other here at the bottom. And then we're going to split into two cells. So we don't have all this extra. We don't have um, a G1. We don't have an S. We don't have a G2. Right? We don't have any interphase. We basically just have mitosis. We have, we have 
of S basically of DNA replication and then the cell divides, that's it. And then about 20 minutes later, it can do it again. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Hopefully better, not worse. Much better. Yeah, the picture's a little nicer in your book on page 243, right? Um, showing you how much of the actual space inside a bacteria their DNA actually takes up. I draw mine as that little circle kind of off to the side so that is oftentimes when I'm drawing bacteria, I'm drawing something else that they're doing. But in real life, or it's more like that picture where the DNA takes up all the most of the space inside the cell. All right, anything else? Questions, worries, concerns? Yes, no. All right, so we're down here. All right, then I will see you on Wednesday and we'll start talking about genetics problems. If you have any other questions, um, that's all I know.